Sid really needs very little introduction. The, the best caving filmmaker the world has ever seen, oh. by a margin. And uh, Sid... <laughs> so I will pass, pass you over to Sid. I wanted to put things in perspective. Um, because one of the situations you find yourself in as a filmmaker is being an interface. You're an interface between caving and television. And also through that, through the general public. Um, and of course, you haven't got much control sometimes of what television wants to do. Um, and we all face that, even today. I know Gavin has had the same sort of problems, that television want something that grabs an audience and they're not particularly bothered just how true it is to the subject. And I've had that all my life. And I, it, I've had some stand-up arguments from time to time and usually lost. So don't blame me, folks. Some of it was them. Caving's changed so much. This is the team I, when I started, this was in the late 50s. And this is what cavers look like. This is what we, we look like. I'm there on the um, far side. And Harry Long there, up in the top. And this was the first sort of lighting. You'd buy a, a lamp from a, a cycle shop and you'd cut up the case um, so that it had a bit to fit in the helmet and you'd use one of these belt batteries with a couple of wires in. The trouble is, when they got wet, they fell apart. And, you, you know, you lost your light. You put a, a three-and-a-half-volt bulb in, if you remembered, and they blew sometimes when it was new. So you've always got to carry spare bulbs. Um, the old fibre miners' helmet. There'll be a few of you here that remember those. You could mould them to your head. That was the advantage. They'd fit any size head. That was the caving shop. All that stuff came from army surplus stores. Boots, boiler suits, um, and certainly ammo boxes. Um, when I joined the BSA, they said that... Uh, Eli Simpson used to say that the electron ladder was too dangerous because too small a team could tackle too big a hole. So he insisted that we used old rope ladders and hemp rope which got acid on it from time to time and just fell apart, as did the ladders. And this was the sta standard caving bag. Um, and again, from the ex-Abrid shop, um, I used to rely on these to carry half my stuff. And that's all changed. Um, due partly to that man. I was fortunate enough to film at the petrol factory when he was there. Unfortunately, the film never came to light. Um, I mean, it's gone forever now, but I've got a few stills from it. In fact, caving has almost become respectable. Well, caving has, cavers haven't, but that's beside the point. The interface business, I'm saying that you've got caving on one side and television on the other, and sometimes they get so far apart that you're straddling to try and keep the two together. I was going to say something about uh, legs as far apart as the girls in the Bangkok massage parlours, but I better not. Um, and photography is also serving that purpose. It's showing what we do to the general public. Um, magazine articles. And you never saw it before. All you got in the papers was uh, um, articles about rescues which is what I set out to try and change. Um, but I didn't really have the tools. Expeditions, the, all the finds that you guys have made on expeditions have made so much difference to the public attitude um, towards caving. And the science. So caving is now seen as a useful tool, um, particularly in China, of course, where they need the water resources, but all over. Um, in archaeology and so on. But back in my day, it used to be old. <laughs> so 
particularly filming. Uh, just a quick run through the equipment. You know, the first camera I had, a clockwork Bolex, um, wind-up clockwork, and it run about a minute on one wind. Um, it took a 100-foot roll um, of 16mm film. That gives you about two and a half minutes of film. And, of course, there's no sound uh, involved. There's no reflex viewfinder or sound. It mostly used with a, a wide-angle lens because interchangeable lens weren't fast enough. And they were certainly not waterproof. And when I did some of these things like this in the wallows in Ingleborough Cave, well, this is actually in um, Kingsdale, but I'd put a plastic bag over the bottom half of the camera so the camera could dip in the water. And they got dirty. Um, you know, this one's perfectly clean, but, but when you see the others, um, and when they got dirty, then they scratched. And have you tried changing a 100-foot... Well, you won't have done. Trying to change a 100-foot spool and keep the camera clean inside when you've got mud running out of your sleeves is somewhat difficult. Then I got a, into the electric Bolex, no winding up. They had these big magazines would fit on top, but that was impossible to use in a cave. Um, and that would only give you 12 minutes. And it costs a lot of money to, run a four, to buy and process 400 feet of film. Sound, um, tape recorder, which I showed before. And this thing, I used a gun mic originally, because that's what we did in sound, the sound department. But I couldn't use the standard wind gag. Um, wind gag wasn't really necessary anyway. But to protect it, I put it in this drain pipe, which had been drilled with a lot of holes. And film cameras are noisy. So my camera was protected by a, a, a wetsuit with, lined with carpet. That was, that was the sound blimp. Clapper boards, of course, you have a clapper board on every shot. A sync cable going from the um, camera to the sound recorder, which wasn't always easy. And then I got a crystal sync unit, which you plug one into the camera and one into the um, tape recorder and it held them in sync. That was fine until we got out to New Guinea and it ceased to work, so everything was out of sync. Helmet microphones. Um, we got into, when, particularly when we were doing Pipikin, we, we put in a microphone in the helmet and running a cable down. Uh, just a, a, one of these little electric microphones just stuck in the helmet, a um, bit like I'm wearing now, but the cable ran down, no radio mics, because they won't work in there through the rock, and the cable came out the, the leg it was supposed to be, except Jill, um, that had a hole in the crutch of a wetsuit, wetsuit and so I kept on pushing the cable back in, which was a, I should have filmed, but I never did. And some of you heard the other story about Jill, which I won't go into now, I've not got time. Lighting, um, I had a couple of these at the beginning, I can't remember quite what I had for Gaping Gill, um, what the 93 cells was about, but my original lights were like this. Um, two six-volt lead-acid motorcycle cells put in, a, put in an ammo box, and you some cheap, cheap lamps, 100, 100 watts, gave you about 10-foot working distance um, at, at maximum. And there was a few other problems. The acid leaked out all over, and every so often they'd break. These, the connectors, are plastic um, phono plugs, which got bashed and broke and let water in, which wrecked the cell. And then I, went, I did the Castle Guard film, and Derek had these made specially, which were backpacks, which contained um, a mobile scooter battery, one of the um, snow, snowmobile batteries. And uh, we charged them by an ingenious device. He ran a cable a mile into the cave, um, which was also a telephone cable. Then at night, the telephone cable was used to charge the cells a mile in. They were put in series, and the current was controlled from outside, so, so you could charge them all. But you had deadly voltages running down the cable, but nobody was, made sure nobody was in the cave at that, part, at that time, at that part of the cave. And then it occurred to me that 
When you're carrying lead acid batteries down, you're carrying a load of lead down with the electricity in it, and you take the electricity out and the lead still weighs the same. Um, so, hang on, there's something wrong here. We're, this lead shouldn't be there. Maybe there's a way of burning fuel directly to make light. And I saw these bullfinch lights and decided to experiment. And I made this thing, which had six bullfinch burners. And uh, it, it ran off a colour gas cylinder. Um, it, it was highly dangerous. And we nearly had severe burns on the first time I used it. Um, and that's as, f as far as it went. I decided it wasn't a good idea. Then um, Andy will remember this thing. It was a four kilowatt light I'd actually produced for China. And it had um, 16 250 watt projector bulbs on it. And consequently, 160 amps it drew from that. It was, a, it was actually a special um, aircraft battery. And that gave us about 15 minutes of, of, of big light for a big chamber. That's the only way you had a chance of lighting anything of any size. The battery charging, I made my own battery chargers because you made, needed a lot. You didn't have the electronics available, um, simple electronics to control them. So I used car bulbs in series, which had certain advantages, advantages because they acted as an indicator. Um, and when they dimmed, you know, the battery was, char was charged. Um, Another story, charging underground. I used a similar system in Otter Hole um, to charge underground. And I had a, a transformer. And it was a circular transformer, a two-idle transformer, held with a single bolt. And with a uh, carrying it in, the bolt came loose. And when I got there, the outer windings had been damaged. And we were in for a week or so. So it couldn't work unless I had a, I charged batteries. OK, and, and so... I, I had to rewind the transformer in the cave so, to get it to work. So compared with carrying a GoPro down, this is the sort of equipment I'd need for a full day's filming. You see, I needed a lot of helpers. Weekend after weekend, I, I used to be able to empty a pub. The more they drunk on a Saturday night, the more likely they were to say yes. But the more they drunk on a Saturday night, the more likely they were to not turn up on the Sunday. And most cavers, not looking at anybody in particular, make bloody awful actors. And a tired, cold caver doesn't give a shit about your handling your equipment, but they will complain a hell of a lot if it doesn't work when it gets there. Next time, they say no. This is just quick. Sort of apology um, for telling some actors to look cold when they've been standing under a waterfall for about an hour. Um, but, uh, by explanation, when you did, told a caper to do something, they would look, they would struggle doing something. You don't want to film it, so do it again for the film, and they'd do it perfectly because of their ego. So even if they were cold, they wouldn't look cold. Um, the many times that helpers carried heavy batteries and then it, the number of days we spent filming stuff that nothing finished up in the finished film. Um, cavers had to do pitches several times, so I'd get a number of shots from top and bottom. Cold, wet hours, hours uh, that I put my helpers through. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, you know, if you think about it, I didn't carry the damn film, somebody else carried it. <laughs> But seriously, it's been a hell of a journey. And, you know, remember that we may not like some of the things the television and the press do, but it's important to, to at least converse with them. Such a privilege to be part of.
Thank you very much. Cheers.